And we're just gonna continue with Fan the Flame. So we're gonna go right on down the text, right after Power, Love, and a Sound Mind, and we're gonna just keep on reading what Paul is writing to Timothy. Um, I, Dustin mentioned a couple weeks ago that we took a 10-year anniversary trip um, to Rome. And in Rome, I love history. I'm a huge history geek. And so, thank my people. Thank you. It's going to be a good service for me. <laughs> All three of you and me. That will work for. Um, <laughs> And so uh, we were in Rome, and I wanted to see all the sites. And so he was so sweet. He, like, went to all the sites with me as I'm, like, you know, <laughs> Googling all the facts about it. And one of the places that we went was the, the cell where Paul was imprisoned. And so we actually got to stand in the cell that Paul stood in and wrote the book, 2 Timothy, that we're about to read. And I brought a picture for you because I thought, oh, nice, there it is. Um, this is a picture that we took in the cell. This is what it looked like. And I just want to paint a picture for you of what, what the surroundings were when Paul wrote the words that we're about to read. And so this is the cell that he was in. That's the rock that they would chain him to. That was the potty hole. And obviously there was not modern lighting. <laughs> so it would have been very, very dark. And so this is where we find Paul. We find Paul in this place as we read these words. This is what he writes. This is at the end of his life. He knows he's about to be executed. And so he wants to get some final thoughts out to the, the, the young pastor that he mentored. And so these are important words. All of Paul's words are important and wonderful, but these are very important just because they were some of his last that we know of. So we're going to start 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 12. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. And then the next verse is where we're going to stay all day long today. And by all day long, I mean the next 30 minutes. Don't worry. <laughs> Pastor D has given me a time limit. Um, he says, for this reason, for this reason, the fact that he's a missionary and a pastor and following God's call on his life, for this reason, I also suffer these things. So, the reason that Paul is suffering is because he's in a situation that God got him into. <laughs> Have you ever felt like following God almost sets you up for more trouble? Like anybody ever signed up for a mission trip? Yeah, see, yes, it, 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 everybody experiences this. You step out and you're like, I'm going to start waking up in the mornings and spending time with God. You say, well, I'm going to join the lead team and then all hell breaks loose in your life. Like we've all been there. And so what Paul is saying is, I got a target on my back and I'm in all of these situations because I said yes to God, which is interesting. And then he says, nevertheless, in true Paul fashion, nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know who I have believed, and not just believed, but this is what he says, I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. This is my translation, Jamie Bates' translation. In the midst of all of my pain, all of my suffering, all of my questions, I have somehow become very persuaded. And because I am persuaded, as I sit in this cell and I can hear them sharpening the sword that's about to take off my head in a few days, I can say, and this is what the message translation translates that verse as, I have not one regret, is what the message says. I have not one regret, and then he says, and I've never been more sure of my ground. I've cried literal tears when Kroger got my click list order wrong before. <laughs> I blame that on hormones. I have been upset because the overhead bin in an airplane was full at times. I have known troubles <laughs> and sufferings. <laughs> These sorts of things are, we experience in daily life. Things don't go right. Things don't go well. Things don't go as we planned or as we wanted. And so we get kind of riled up about it and, and upset, and then we usually move on and go over it. Well, I want to paint a picture for you of Paul's troubles, because Paul would have 
loved to have a Krogor click list problem because here are some of the things that Paul has gone through in the life that we know that he lived. He was beaten 39 times on five different occasions. He was shipwrecked three times. He was beaten with rods three times. He was imprisoned multiple times, this being his last one. He was hunted by mobs. He was stoned, just stoned once, so drifted at sea for one, a, a day and a half. Drifted at sea, that is my worst nightmare. I would rather just a shark eat me at that point. Like, <laughs> take, just send the shark, Lord. <laughs> no more drifting. In constant danger, these are the things that he describes. In constant danger, sleepless, in hunger, and in bad health. And these are just the physical things that he suffered. This is just what happened to his body. I've had a broken bone before, and I've had a broken heart before. And I take a broken heart, I mean a broken bone, every day of the week. Because what happens to us externally in our bodies is difficult. But not only did Paul have a body that was almost almost maimed by the time he died. He also had an internal struggle. Anybody have any internal struggles in here? He had struggles inside that were also plaguing him. He was shamed and slandered publicly by people. And not just once, his whole Christian life, he was made fun of, he was undermined, he was, he was shamed, he would, he, people spoke about him publicly. If there had been blogs and Facebook, oh my goodness. Like he, people were after him. You can imagine what that does. I mean, if like one person shames me or says something mean, I'm like, oh God, I just, he, it was his whole life was this. The, the, the rejection and the feelings of just being abandoned. His friends, people he thought were in this with him forever, abandoned him when he went to prison. He had anxiety over different things that God had asked him to do and the churches that he had planted, and he had a shameful past. He was really um, bad before God. It's pretty cool that one of the baddest guys before God became probably the best and greatest Christian to ever live, right? <laughs> but he had a really um, traumatic past, and he carried the memories of killing Christians, killing Stephen, kill, like, like killing people that, for the God that he now serves. That didn't just get erased from his memory. He remembered, he remembered that he worked against God for many, many years. And that's hard to carry. He had extreme weariness. He was very, very tired and weary. And at one point he talks about being totally lonely. So my question today is, how does one walk through all of that? And at the end of his life, on his death stone, write the words, I have not one regret. And I couldn't be more sure of the ground I stand on. Who, who can do that? Well, we're going to find out today. We're going to dig into his life. The title of today's message is Trusting God in Troubles. Trusting God in Troubles. Will you pray with me? God, we just love you so much here. And I'm just so grateful that we can ask you to come and you do. And I'm just so grateful that you draw us to you. And I just pray right now for your anointing to be on these words, God. We know that your anointing, the Bible says, breaks the yoke of bondage. And so I pray for bondage-breaking anointing power today to be in this room. I pray, God, that you would give me words that will sustain weary hearts. I pray for hunger and faith and a renewed sense of love for you today, God, and gratefulness and trust in you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Anyone here ever found themselves in unexpected trouble? You do, you have, if you don't know, because you live in Texas and the weather system here is absolutely terrifying. And so um, I used to be a missionary in Thailand. And I, when I was in Thailand, I was working after the tsunami had come and kind of wiped out a whole coastal city. So I lived in that city and I would help teams come and, and bring care and relief. To the, to the cities or the people without homes. And so I lived there alone and I had a little motorcycle. And really it's, it's not like a motorcycle. It's like a, mo a motorcycle. <laughs> it was a Honda something, Honda Z350 maybe, or it sounds kind of familiar. Um, pulling it from way back when. I had a pink helmet and I would cruise up and down the coast from camp to camp and help people and, and do mission work. So at one point in my cruising, I'm getting ready to, to go back up the coast, 
on my moto, and I see a storm brewing behind me. And this is before smartphones. This is before the Weather, weather Channel app, which I'm just like, you know when the notification pops up? I'm, I'm just like, oh my goodness. Dustin's going to make me delete that too. I am already have had to let go of WebMD. <laughs> he already was like, this cannot continue. <laughs> so I'm sure my weather app will be the next to go. <laughs> but this is before all that. So you actually like no, found out a storms were coming by like seeing them coming. And so I saw a storm brewing and it was coming. And so I just hit my little motorcycle and I'm like Zzzz, up the coast. And I'm going, I'm like, I can outrun this thing. I got this. Me and this Honda Z3 F50, whatever. <laughs> we, we have got this thing. I'm going to outrun this storm. So the storm's coming and I'm going to all the Thai people who are like the most wonderful people in the world. They're like, my, my. Like, no, it means no in Thai. No, no, like, don't do it. Like, get to shelter. And I'm like, I got this. Which, telling this story is hilarious about myself. I was telling the earlier service because I cannot believe I was this person. I can hardly drive down Greenville now without thinking I'm going to die. And so the fact that I, like, drove a motorcycle in Thailand, I'm just like, hey, what changed me? Two little boys named Jude and Genesis. I tell you what, motherhood, it, may, it changes you. So... I'm driving and, and the storm eventually, of course, it, of course, it catches me and I'm slipping all over and I'm off and I'm, now I'm walking the moto and all the Thai people are like, come in, come in. And so I got refuge with a sweet little Thai family and, and everything was okay. But all that to say, trouble usually comes without warning, doesn't it? And there are some storms just in our practical lives that we just can't outrun. Some things just catch up with us and we find ourselves in places that we never thought we would be. We find, our, we find ourselves with issues and troubles and pain that we never, never imagined that this is how things would turn out. And my question today is, as we jump into this text is, what do you do when trouble catches up to you? What's your go-to? Is it calling someone? Is it complaining? Is it losing your mind, losing your faith, losing your cool? Like we all have things that we do when trouble hits because trouble isn't fun. I don't like it any more than anybody else does. But the issue is that trouble hits us all at different times. And as Christians, we have to be ready for that and know what to do when it does. So today we're going to jump into Paul's text and we're going to find out, Paul, what kind of man said those things so confidently at the end of his life, and we're going to find out how he was able to say them through this text. So the first thing we know, need to know about trouble is that trouble is inevitable. And I don't need to preach this topic long because you all know, anybody who's been alive for more than two seconds <laughs> knows, I mean, you, we come into this our world screaming and crying, <laughs> right? Like we come in crying, we come in in trouble. And so everybody has things that hit and pain that happens. John 16, says, in the world, you will have trouble. I've seen good people bury children. I've seen good people go bankrupt. I've seen good people in hospitals. I've seen good people have spouse, watch spouses walk out on them. Good people. In this world, you will have trouble, it says in John. Matthew 5, 45 says, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The good and the bad, the rain falls on us all. No one escapes the pain of life. And even Paul one time tells an earlier story before he was in, at this point in his life, earlier in his life, and he says, I, I have something that I ask God to take away three times. Three times, Paul said, Paul, the greatest man of God, Paul, who we're here, we're here because of Paul, prayed three times to a God that loved him, will you take it away? Have you ever prayed, God, will you take it away? I have, probably three times today. <laughs> God, will you take it away? Like, what? Like, will you, will you help? Will you, will you just take it away? Oftentimes he does, and sometimes we work out of our troubles. And so what I want to talk about today is what do we do when it isn't taken away? What do we do when God doesn't take us out, out of our, our troubles and out of our pain and out of our past and out of our stuff? What do we do when we're just in trouble? So... Uh, number, the second thing we need to know about trouble is it's survivable. Trouble is survivable. Paul says in this verse, I suffer. Yeah, we all, we all suffer. We all, we all suffer. We all have pain. Paul says, I suffer, but nevertheless. Paul, I mean, he is never, he is never not at his best. <laughs> I suffer, but nevertheless is what he says. Nevertheless, we have got to adopt as Christians a nevertheless attitude about our troubles. Yeah, I'm not special because I'm in trouble. 
I'm not special. I'm not special because I'm in pain. I'm not special because I have somebody that hurt me. I suffer, but nevertheless, a new attitude about our troubles. My son, my second born son is just a beast. And he is always at 100 all the time. And he's very tough. And he's just always in beast mode. I was like, he, even when he sleeps, he thrashes. <laughs> thrashes and thrashes. I woke up three mornings ago when I let him sleep with me and Dustin was gone with his little booty in my face. I told Dustin, never again. That's the, that, I draw the line at that little two-year-old booty in my face. That is not what I want to wake up to. There's been multiple times where I've woken up to Genesis standing by my bed, look, watching me sleep, <laughs> going, <"Ugh." laughs> multiple times, not just one time, multiple times, Ugh. I've woken up to him growling at me. But he always, he always, I always tell him, change your attitude. Change your attitude. I'm here to say to say to me and say to you, it's time to change our attitudes about trouble. It's time to change our attitudes about suffering. Uh, Paul, in the earlier years of his life, he was in a city and he wanted to go to a different city. And um, he was planning on leaving the current city that he was in. But then he changed his mind. And it's funny what changed his mind. He wrote to his friends and he said, I wanted to come and hang. But he said here where I'm at, it's interesting. A lot of doors have been opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. And he goes, so I'm just going to stay right here. Because this is the man who wrote those words, who said, I suffer, but nevertheless, there are many who oppose me. My version is, come at me, bro. Paul, Paul is not looking for an out. He's not looking for an easy. He's not looking for, he is looking for, oh, somebody opposes me? Oh, come on. That means something good's around the corner for me. Paul says, um, I am persuaded. Next. So the question is, we all want to change our attitudes, but how? How? We all want to be better. How? He says, I am persuaded. The other word is, I am convinced or I am sure of my ground. The thing about persuasion is it happens in our minds. Almost every battle that we will win or lose happens right here. The Bible says that as a man thinketh, so is he. As we think, so we are. As we think, so we act. As we think, so we love God. As we think, so we parent. As we think, so we are. Everything happens right here. Romans 12 says, if you want to be transformed, renew that mind. Get that mind renewing. And so the persuasion that Paul's happen, talking about happened inside of his mind. We've got to change our minds about some things. We've got to change our minds about God in areas. We've got to change minds about ourselves in areas. We've got to change our minds about our future in areas. You know God's got a good future for you. The just who live by faith, there are always better days ahead. The Bible says that is, that is your inheritance, that is your right as a Christian, is that you got good days ahead. God's in your corner. He's in your trouble. He is in your suffering. But we have to become persuaded because there will be times of trouble. And I'm here to tell you, the devil doesn't care if you sit here, if you serve here, or you sing here. He doesn't want you to change your mind because if you start changing your mind, you start changing how you act, what you believe, what you think, and your faith levels go up and your hope levels go up and your peace levels go up. The devil knows what happens when we change our minds. So he wants to keep us locked up in despair and anguish and, and anxieties and unbelief and lack of hope. He wants to lock us up in our troubles. And what brings all those things? Troubles. It's troubles that bring them. It's troubles that make me scared. I'm super scared all the time. <laughs> it's troubles that make me scared. It's troubles that make me feel despair. It's troubles that make me feel hopeless. But not Paul. Not Paul. He had a nevertheless, nevertheless. Persuasion means to have confidence in and to trust. God, I want to be stronger in my troubles. God, I want to be, have greater faith. God, I want to know what to do with my worries. God, I want to have better self-control. We got to change, start changing our minds. It all happens in the mind. Don't wait until prison. Don't wait until you're in prison to make up your mind about God. Make up your mind about God now, and prison will become a nevertheless. 
Nevertheless, make it up now. So there is so much power in what we believe and think about God. And don't you let other people tell you about him. Don't you let your college professors tell you about him. Don't you let your family tell you about him. Don't you let your kids tell you about him. Don't you, you go open your Bible and you find out who God is and what he says about himself. And if you can get that inside of here, oh my goodness. And we'll, we'll have nevertheless lives. Trouble's not going anywhere, but we can be nevertheless people and live nevertheless lives if we can become persuaded. The third point is trouble is, this is a great one. This is the good news of the day. It's thrivable. It's thrivable. We don't survive as Christians. We don't scrape by. We don't, no, we do have pain, but God changes it. As a Christian, if you're a Christian and you are wrapped in Jesus, then that means that everything you have suffered and everything that's come against you and all of those things that have tried to hurt you, he'll make them right. He'll make them good. He'll turn them around. Trouble is thrivable. This is what Paul says in Romans 8. This is before this letter was written. Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness? These are all the things he had been through. Or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. This is how he's describing his life. And we're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Sounds, sounds rough, right? Well, we got a nevertheless Paul on our hands because he says, Nay, in all these things, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. And then what? I'm persuaded. The power of persuasion. The power of persuasion to say, yeah, I may have trouble here. Yeah, I may have health stuff here. I may have family stuff here, relational stuff here, faith stuff here, mental stuff here, emotional stuff here. But I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. And I am persuaded about it. Now, this is the cool thing about being a conqueror. I was thinking, how do you be more than a conqueror? Like, conquering seems like the ultimate victory. <laughs> like, conquering. <laughs> But this is what it means in the Bible, and this is what it means for us, Every, everybody who follows God and believes in Jesus. It means that all your troubles and all your pain and all the traumas and all the sufferings, God takes, and we don't only overcome them, and we don't only get freedom from them, and we don't only move past them. He takes them all, and he puts them under our feet. This is how, the, this is how it's described. He puts them under our feet, so we stand over them as a conqueror. But that's just a conqueror. That sounds good. I'm like, I'll take conquer. <laughs> for, a little, for a few less sufferings, I'll take conquer. <laughs> but Paul says, oh, no, 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 no. What, what, we get something more because there's always more with Jesus. And he says, no, they're not just under your feet. If you hang in, they'll eventually serve you. Everything that hurt you will eventually serve you. For a persuaded mind, pain will always pay you back. If you've got a persuaded mind, every single thing that's ever come against you, you can take and throw under your feet in the name of Jesus and say, hey, I may still feel it, I may still be in trouble, but I know that I am more than a conqueror and these things will serve me in the end. Don't give up in your troubles, they will pay you back. Don't, don't roll over and take it and just become a, a despairing victim of the, the enemy, that is not thriving. That is not thriving. No, 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 no. We are more than conquerors. We sit in our troubles. We pull God down into our troubles with us, and we say, okay, God, come hell or high water, it's me or you, and I am believing and persuaded that you are going to put these things under my feet and make them serve me. Albert Einstein, one of the most brilliant men to ever live, so says, tells me on Google, Really, I heard something about the age of relativity, and then he's just really, really smart. <laughs> but he said something really interesting. He said it's not about himself. He said it's not that I'm so smart, it's just that I stay with problems longer. 
It's not that I'm so smart. I just stay with problems a little longer than the next guy. It's not that I have so much faith. It's just that I stay in trouble with God a little longer. It's not that I'm so gifted. I just stay in trouble a little while longer with God. It's not that I have all this. It's just that I am willing to stay in trouble. And even if it's what it means a few months or a few hours or a few days of feeling like I'm in a pit with ears streaming down my face and anxiety in my heart, not knowing it, I can look up with Paul at God and say, oh, I can trust you in my trouble. Job said, though you slay me, I will trust in you. We got to work our trouble or it's going to work us. We got to work our trouble or, or it's, it's going to work us. I, um, when I moved back from Thailand, I moved back to Washington State to marry Pastor Dustin. And I was super happy about Dustin. But I did not love Washington State because of the rain. It drizzles all the time. And so I have this really vivid memory of moving back. And I had left the equator. I was on the equator, like Thailand. And then I was, my missions base was based in Hawaii. You're all losing so much respect for me right now. <laughs> You're never going to send me on a mission trip. And so I come back, and I was just really, like, bummed about the rain. And um, I was at this little burger joint called Burgerville. And I was in the drive through line getting my burger. And they had that rain awning where the rain just kind of falls off, you know. And I was second back. I was about to go under it. And I just remember, even now, the trauma is coming back. <laughs> the, the rain just coming down. And I just remember watching it fall and fall and fall. And I'm like, oh, what have I done? What have I done? I mean, it's like I can still get out of this, right? Like, what have I done? So I cried literal tears in my little, I think it was a Nissan Maxima, cried literal tears. I was like, this rain, it's so hard. I don't want, I hate the rain. I don't want to live in the rain. Now, fast forward 15 years, 12 years, and yesterday I wake up to rain. I'm like, oh, praise God for the rain. I love rain. I opened the blinds in my house. I wouldn't have got into Dustin's car because he's gone. He'll lie. He always knows when I've been in there, though. <laughs> I, gra I grabbed his keys. I, went, I turned the heat warmers on. I went and parked at the lake, and I just watched the rain come down. I was like, oh, what a great pre-service day of rain. The rain's the same, yeah. right? The rain's the rain. What changed was me. Yeah. I changed. I grew. The rain didn't, the rain didn't change to fit my circumstances. I grew in my troubles. <clears throat> my mother-in-law is awesome. We call her Button. And that's what happens when you let your grandchildren choose your grandparent name. We call her Button. And um, she is really funny to watch movies with because she's like an all, like she's experiencing it as it's happening physically. And so she's always like, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Oh, witty. That's what she calls her daughter. Witty, witty. He loves her. Like watching a romantic comedy. He loves her. He doesn't know it, but he loves her. This is real. This is like real. She is in it. She's in the movie. He loves her. What's going to happen? They're going to work out right. I watched 24 with her, that old show with Jack Bauer. And I was like, oh, this is not good for my mental health. <laughs> the, the anxiety is being absorbed. She's like, no, don't drop the bomb. No, you can't. No. Is Jack Bauer going to live? And I said at one point, Button, you know that somebody's already written the end, and it's all going to work out. It's a rom-com. <laughs> they're sticking together. They're not going anywhere. There may be a little few tears, but they're going to get back together. And I was thinking about that this morning, and I was thinking, wow, that's really what we have as a, in a Christian life, is somebody up in heaven looking down, going, hey, I'm sorry about that trauma. I'm so sorry about that divorce, and I'm so sorry about that child, and I'm so sorry about that lost job, and I'm so sorry about that pain, I'm so sorry about that unfairness, and I, but, but it's a good thing you got a God that you can trust in trouble, because I know the end of the story, and he, I can just see him up there being like, let me move this here, and move that, and if you could just wait, if you could just give me a minute, God says, if you could just give me a minute, I promise you that I will put these things under your feet, and some they're going to serve you. But we've got to give him a minute to do it. We can, get to heaven and, we can get to heaven and yet lose ground on earth when we refuse to trust God in trouble. We've got to be people who trust God in trouble. So how? Paul says, I know whom I have believed 
and therefore I am persuaded. So a knowing of God has to happen in order for a persuasion to take root. And there must be a knowing of God, an experiencing of God. It's not a sit in a pew and hear. It's not a sing a song that somebody else has written. It's not, it's a, God, I'm in trouble. It's a morning where you roll out of bed and you're like, oh God, it's me and you today. I got nothing else. It's the time when you lose your job. You think everything's never going to work out again. It's not you trying to make your own way. And be, it's saying before you go face your wife, your kids, the job search is you saying, God, it's me or you. It's me and you. It's, it's me and you. It's pulling him into moments. It's pulling him into pain. It's pulling him in a, in a real, real way. This word no means to discover, to inspect, to pay attention to and to visit with. I love the visit with because it's so practical, isn't it? So it seems so easy. But it's easier to get up, drive to church, and sit through a message sometimes than it is to visit, visit with God. But if we want to be persuaded people, we have to know him. Nine years before this letter, Paul wrote, nine years before his death, Paul wrote this, I want to know Christ. It was one of Paul's dreams. Dreams in his life. I want, to, I want to know Christ. Then he says, in the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, which he did. I want to know Christ. I just think it's pretty amazing that at the end of his life, he said, I know him. And because I know him, because I visited with him, because every time somebody beat me with a rod, I pulled him into it. And every time somebody whipped me with lashes, I pulled him into it. And every time I drifted at sea for a day and a half, please, Lord, never. Every time I drifted at sea for a day and a half, he was right there with me. And because I know him, now I can be persuaded. There are some battles personally that I fought that I just never thought I would make it through. But I always had, since I came to God, I always had something in my heart that wanted to know him. And sometimes when we struggle with knowing him and being persuaded, it's like it's just so, can be so overwhelming and everything. And I think the best way to start knowing him is to want to know him. That's so what Paul said. I, wanna, I just want to know you, God. I want to know you. I don't know if he knew it would result in being so persuaded that he went to the chopping block like full of confidence with a come at me bro attitude. I don't know if Paul knew that's what it would give him. I think he just wanted to know him. And throughout my life, I've had battles, as have you, and I've had struggles, as have you, and to be really honest, there's been multiple times where I thought, I don't know if I can make it. I knew I'd be fine physically. I wasn't in a Paul situation, but there were so many moments where I'm like, I don't know if I'm ever going to smile again, and that wasn't over Kroger clicklist stuff. <laughs> this is the real stuff of life that you probably walked, some of you walked in here with. There's times where I laid in my closet and I was just like, God, like, it's just me and you. There were times where I was so overcome with fears or pain or people I love being hurt and broken, losing relationships, dealing with things I would never have to deal with. There were so many times that I just never thought that I would, I would be whole again. And as I've learned to trust God, with my troubles and let them train me to let to take all the pain and all the troubles and say God it's either I'm staying in this pit and I'm going to complain and be depressed for the rest of my life or I'm going to get up the faith one more time to trust you and as I have done that as troubles come my way and as I'm still doing that as I face troubles now I can tell you that there is not one thing I've ever been through that doesn't serve me now that doesn't empower me now I can stand up here and say these things with authority because those things serve me there's pain behind these words there's heartache behind these words there's doubts behind these words but there is nothing that I have consistently trusted God to Okay, organize, make it right. I'm going to make it right. I'm going to, I'm going to, all things, all things work together for the good of those who love God. And so now at the end, I think about things that I thought would take me out now. And for one, I smile, which I never thought I would do. And for a second, I feel like if I could face every single one again, I'd look at him and say, thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you for that hurt. Thank you for that betrayal. Thank you for that thought planted. Thank you for, thank you for that pain. Thank you for that experience. Thank you. Thank you for every trouble that ever crossed my door. Thank you. Because you know what you did, trouble? You know what you did, pain? You pushed me to the one person who will make it all serve me. The one person who could make it all right. The one person, the only person that could take a bunch of messed up lives, a bunch of pain, a bunch of stuff and say, oh, it's a good thing that you got a God like me because I'm going to take it all. I'm going to put it under your feet and it's going to serve you, girl. And indeed, it has. And that is my prayer for you. I'm going to have the band come up. And as we close, uh, Paul, in the end of this letter, he's at the end of his life, as we've said, and it's, it's an old man telling a younger man, Timothy. He says, I fought a good fight. I fought the good fight. And I think what Paul was saying to Timothy was, you saw a lot of miracles. Paul was an incredibly anointed man. He did miracles. He didn't all just have suffering. He had incredible victories. Raised people from the dead. And planted churches. Thousands of people came. Paul said, I know you saw all that, but let me tell you how I how I fought the fight in this letter. I became persuaded. So my prayer for us today is that we become persuaded people, that we can trust God with our troubles, knowing that he's good and he's for us, and that we're more than conquerors through him who loved us.